Hi. Welcome to Karen's Conversations number 39. We're getting up there. And today I'm going to talk about the IT and the IT service management tools landscape. It's my uh, working title. And I have the pleasure of Paul Phillips from New Zealand joining me in this discussion. So welcome, Paul. And without any further ado, I'll get you to introduce yourself. Hi, Karen. Thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation to join you today. Um, so yeah, I've been in the, the industry for uh, or a number of years. I spent 25 odd years working in IT, having started out uh, uh, working at uh, Education Institute after graduating. Um, it was back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. So you know, back in the early days of networking, um, when we used to run coax cables out of the window of one building into another. That was the campus wide <laughs> network. Um, so I got a really good base uh, in the industry across a broad spectrum of everything from those early networking days and PCs, um, early Nobel uh, Windows servers, uh, right through the um, development of infrastructure to the sort of technology that we have today. So um, having spent the time in those first few years getting a really broad base, did a bit of software development and uh, really worked in a team on the student enrollment system at AIT and what I think you'd now call a DevOps team. Okay. Uh, it was five or six people who basically did everything um, from managing the servers. We did all the, worked really closely with the user um, department who were doing the student enrollments. And um, so I had a very good understanding of the business and we'd look at what they needed. We'd go back and we'd design the, the components that they required, whether it's in the finance or the enrollment side, whatever was happening, and then go through that cycle of rapidly developing, getting it tested and pushing things into production. It was a high pressure environment where you know, in the early days of that system, the first time they used it for student enrollments, they were queued out the out onto the street and up around the corner to the next block. So <laughs> there was a lot of pressure to get things going. Yeah. Um, so I was a lot of learning in the early stages of my career around that sort of thing. Ended up focusing a lot on infrastructure, um, TVNZ for 10 years, infrastructure manager for a while, spent the last four years there working in broadcast technology, um, which was in some ways a lot more interesting than IT, but uh, it was really the adoption of the IT technology into the broadcast environment where things were no longer you know, a, a black box that did a specific function with a video feed in and a video feed out. Everything was moving towards running software on a, a server connected to an IP network. Um, so, last project I did there was building the storage platform for the New Zealand Freeview environment, free to air digital television. Mm. Um, and yes, yeah, so my last operational role was CTO for Wycliffe, which at the time was one of the largest print companies in New Zealand. Um, that was at a time where um, they were in a lot of financial pressure. And coming in as the CTO there, the challenge for me was um, reducing the budget and delivering better services to the business. Uh, Always a challenge to do both of those things, um, but we achieved that um, in the couple of years I was there. And um, one of the things that happened there was I found the, the Manage Engine software, and we started using Service Desk Plus, Op Manager for some network monitoring and a few other Active Directory tools. Um, so when I left Wycliffe, um, as the company was taken over by another business, an opportunity came up to step out of operational roles into the dark side of the sales industry. And um, that's where I started working as a uh, business development manager for Manage Engine in New Zealand. Um, built the, the business as part of the distribution company here, Soft Solutions, um, for six years, growing um, at a fairly rapid and steady rate over that time until Manage Engine asked me to go over to Australia. Spent 18 months in Sydney as country manager for the vendor, which was a fantastic experience. Um, but at the end of that time, decided for lifestyle reasons to come back home and settled in the north of New Zealand. And um, spending a lot of time at the moment in our motorhome, which I'm sitting in right now, uh, driving around the country, uh, combining a bit of lifestyle and um, mobile office, which is great. I've got a uh, growing number of customers as a new business right around the country. So um, being able to go and see people um, has a, a really strong benefit as well. Absolutely. I'm jealous every time I see you in the motor. <laughs> I want to do that. I want to do that. Um, so tell us a bit. Now, I don't know how you need to pronounce this, Paul. Experno? Ex uh, it's a Perno. The Perno. So this yeah, is, this is your company. So tell us yeah. about that. Well, I started the business having come home, as I said, after being in Sydney for a while and having spent eight years um, working with and for Manage Engine, um, 
in a sales capacity, helping people um, with the implementation of Manage Engine software and using those tools to help solve some problems. After spending 20 odd years of my career with a real focus um, that I developed myself of putting technology solutions in place to solve a business problem, uh, I'd never liked doing technology for the sake of it. And as an IT organization in any business, whether it be public or private sector, you have to deliver value to your organization. Otherwise, what are you there for? You know, the, you've got to understand the goals of the business or the organization and contribute to that, um, whether that's on increasing productivity, reducing costs or increasing profits. At the end of the day, there's got to be a bottom line benefit to what you're doing, whether it's a, a new business system or just in, implementing a piece of infrastructure. Um, what's it going to deliver and be able to articulate that value to the business? So my approach is, uh, uh, I guess, a pragmatic approach to IT management looking for pragmatic cost effective ways to deliver that value um, and through that time with manage engine that was a, a focus because that's as a vendor where they sit in the market so starting my own business it's continuing that philosophy and rather than just working with one vendor anymore i'm bringing in uh, a focused portfolio of vendors that i believe in and believe will help people achieve value and deliver outcomes um, that's really what the the objective is yeah. Good stuff. So what would you say with all that experience, um, and you don't look old enough to have all that experience, by the way, um, <laughs> what are some of the major shifts you've seen probably over the last five years or so in IT? Well, it's an interesting question. I, I, I did a, a presentation at an ITSMF conference a few years ago in Wellington that I called the, the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, so yes, there's a lot of changes. Um, the, the one thing that doesn't change is that driver for delivering value and achieving outcomes. The bit that changes is the, the pace of the technology, the things that we can do. Um, the shift, I guess, from uh, the, it, you could look at things like the cloud migration, um, but then you can look back at that too and say, well, you know, back in the eighties, we were told we would have paperless offices. <laughs> well, we still need paper. <laughs> Back in the 2000s, we were told, early 2010 sort of period, we were told everybody would be in the cloud, but we're not going to all be in the cloud. So there's those things that come along, um, and a lot of things change, and that drives movement in the, the IT industry. Uh, I think there's the recognition of uh, a growing recognition that IT does have to deliver outcomes and deliver value. Um, less and less of the environment where you have the old IT organization or data processing, as it used to be called in the old days, that sits in a corner of the, the room and delivers something to the business that at the end of the day, people say, well, that wasn't any good. Um, you know, it doesn't do what I want. So I think there's been a general shift in those sorts of areas. Um, and of course, the pressure of uh, ever, well, the, the, the ever increasing pressure to reduce cost. We're always trying to do more with less. That's a, a term that never goes away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, when you're talking to organizations that are looking for, you know, new systems or new technologies, um, and I know you talk to a lot of them, what would you say the biggest mistakes they make when they start looking at new options? Um, if you're looking specifically around the, the sort of IT tools and the areas that I deal with, like service management tools, network management, often I think um, it would be fair to say the most common mistake probably is looking for a tool when the tool isn't actually the problem. Uh, they've got existing incumbent tools in an environment, they're not getting what they want in terms of management, whether it be services or operations, um, so look to replace the tool. Um, when actually there's processes or people or the other parts of that triangle that need to be addressed. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, my experience, not as a technologist, but in helping organizations put together, you know, requirements for new service desk software or service management software was exactly that. It's like blame the tool because it's the easiest thing to seem to blame because it's like a tangible thing and you can say yep. it's not working. So we'll go to something else. And when you look at it, it's either the lack of training or lack of uh, effective processes and efficient processes. Mm. So the message was always, well, you know, if you're 
well, not this wasn't a client message, I'll put it in a different way, but if your processes are crap, there's still going to be crap in a different tool. So, you know, there yeah. lies the problem. So and it's interesting because I was talking about that sort of, you know, a decade or so ago and saying, don't just swap out the tool until you've really focused on what the sort of the underlying problem is. Um, so obviously that's still happening from what you've just said, Paul. So what is usually, is there a theme in terms of what the real underlying problem is when they're replacing a tool which they don't need to do? Um, I guess it's different in every environment to a degree, but the, uh, I think sometimes it's a lack of, um, time in some cases or resource availability mm -hmm. and you can talk to organizations where and we've got an example at the moment with a client um in the local government sector where the the people there know what they want to achieve and they're pretty sure they know how to get there um sometimes getting some external perspective on it from a consulting perspective if you like to come mm -hmm. in look at their current environment where they want to get to helps to give them the reassurance that that's they're actually on the right path mm -hmm. uh, but if you don't get to that point and be able to put in place some plans to achieve what you want um, I think that's the the stumbling block sometimes yeah. everybody's so busy right now yeah that that future state always remains a future state yeah and it's hard to lift, lift the head and see a, a bigger picture sometimes when you're just involved in the day to day yeah it's like over the years talking to people about putting in a service management tool um, but they're too busy fighting fires to put in a tool to help them manage this help this better um, it's it's a catch so let's say if you're faced with an organization that's saying we and I've done this not so long ago actually um, and convinced my client not to go to another mm -hmm. tool because there really was yep. a problem from that one outsourcer to another, or one provider to another. Um, what sort of conversation do you have with the client then to convince them that this is not a technology issue and it's something else when they are actually focused on it being technology? Yeah. Um, sometimes it might be just helping them see what the, that they can actually achieve the sorts of things they're talking about in the tool they've got. It might be that they weren't aware of the capability that the tool delivers. Uh, I just had a, a good example of that recently with someone spent a, a day on site with them talking through, well, getting an understanding of where they want to get to mm -hmm. around their service management and then having a look at the tool that they've already got and just going through and helping them see the possibilities. And then the outcome of that was um, between me helping them with some things and them help doing their own development, mm -hmm. actually getting better use of the tool and starting to see some real value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. It's funny how you say yeah, things change but stay the same and it's still like yeah. a tool, you know, um, a fool with a tool is still a fool and all the, you know, the, the cliches. <laughs> it's so true, it's so true. So it keeps vendors in a lot of good business, doesn't it? They'll go from one tool to another to another. Um, so we talked about changes in IT. What about specifically around IT service management? What sort of changes have you seen in that space over the last five years? Um, I guess I'm more, uh, um, well, let me go back a little bit as well, back to my time at TVNZ, um, mm. which was in the early 2000s. I might have started in 99, but early 2000s really after we got Y2K out of the way. Um, the head of technology there started a, an ITIL implementation within the organization. Um, well, it was a service management project, which mm. merged the technology and IT and the broadcast support teams, we all came together, did ITIL training, did workshops to help people understand what service management's actually all about. Mm. Uh, and put together a, a structure and the processes and, and all of that capability. And it made a huge difference in the organization. But that was very early days of, of service management, I think, particularly in New Zealand. Um, and I guess, the reason I've talked about that in response to your question is that it's that that has become not well, I guess more commonplace more understood across the industry that more and more people understand those sorts of terminologies ITIL terminology what a framework is what it means it doesn't mean here's a framework you have to do these things and it's prescribed mm. it's um, to help you build capability to deliver the sort of value and outcomes that you need um, so I think 
more in service management people understand that now um, and there's well there's a lot more tools around that help do it too um, from very expensive tools to very cheap tools and, and somewhere in that spectrum will be the tool that's right for you yep absolutely and it, interesting that i was well i've just this week was at the it service management australia conference mm -hmm. And I actually wrote a little post on this on LinkedIn to say it was really interesting that there was a fundamental, I sensed a fundamental shift. Like the very first keynote was talking from um, Future Crunch, they were called, talking about how change is just happening all the time and it's very disruptive. I was then talking about the need for resilience in the face of constant change. But Tristan Boot was there, he was talking about relationships. Um, uh, and it was very much, and then we had a keynote and I, can't remember his name for the life of me, Robert, somebody, apologies. Um, and he, he um, talked about, you know, the biggest asset that you need to con be concerned about is you. So he talked about physical and mental well-being and all this sort of thing. And there's a real focus on that. So I'm seeing that fundamental shift, a recognition of the people side of everything we do in service. And, um, and also hearing a lot of talk um, about using different tools. So service management being, as, as, as you've you know, um, talked about, it's not just about, so the conversation's changing from ITIL or COVID or Lean or Six Sigma or blah. And I think Penny is eventually dropping that service management is underpinned by ITIL, by Lean, by DevOps, by Agile, whatever. And you pick and choose, like making a, a recipe, Pick and choose the bits that work for your organisation. So that was a positive takeaway from me that people are starting to have those conversations. Because I know uh, Kirsty McGowan, in, I'm sure it's Kirsty, in New Zealand says, you know, she had a client that said, uh, we bought ISIL, but it didn't work. So we got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, the misconception that it's a thing you can implement. Yeah, yeah. and I think that that's a really good point too, that yeah, there, there are all those different um, disciplines or frameworks or guidelines um, but yeah it's a combination of those things and every organization is unique exactly. and it's a case of finding something that fits the culture fits the way you want to work sometimes we have to change the culture <laughs> but um, uh, that's a challenge and I draw another whole different conversation <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and defining what culture actually is there's a lot of um, things being discussed online about that at the moment what is, is culture um, so you say on your website that you over not over you simplify things. So <laughs> you, you simplify things. So do you think organisations like deliber deliberately overcomplicate things, like over engineer and overcomplicate things? And if, if they do, why? Um, I'm not sure if it's a, a done deliberately, but um, done unintentionally, maybe or, or without the thought of um, keeping it simple. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the old KISS principle. Um, it's as relevant now as it was 30 years ago. Um, and keeping things to a manageable size. Uh, you know, if you're talking about a project to implement something, uh, an example, I was talking to a customer just the other day looking for a, a solution around um, monitoring of their infrastructure and business applications. That can be a huge piece of work. Mm -hmm. And to try and tackle all of that in one go, um, makes it a project bigger than being her and uh, you know it never gets properly delivered so decide what the end goal is but break that down into bite-sized chunks when you're talking about monitoring of an environment like that look at the, the most critical business applications and what do you actually need to monitor the performance and availability of that application to know that it's um, achieving what the business requires from it and you can apply that same principle in any area I mean take the, the service management side you can't do the whole of service management in one go but you might look at your incident management or your change management and your problem management um, or the interaction with an operation you know the DevOps sort of capability but look at things in, in bite-sized chunks You've got to have that end view and goal of where you want to get to um, but you can't put in if you then relate that to the tool side you can't do everything in one go um, and I think that's the complexity that some people build into trying to do something that's just bigger than they're going to be able to deliver. Yeah, and I think it's, I don't know, I think it's just a, a technology headset type thing is that we can complicate things.
Africans and rather than, like you say, stepping back and saying, break it down into bite-sized pieces. Mm. You know, it sounds like you said, it sounds a bit agile, doesn't it? You know, let's do something iteratively. Uh, yeah. And are we doing the right thing? And, but, you know, to me, agile is just really com common sense rather than try and do a three-year project, you know, um, yeah. and seeing no output from it until the end of the three years. And then the output yeah. the wrong thing anyway. Um, right. Looking forward, we've looked at past and present. Looking forward, mm. what big changes do you think might be coming in IT service management in the coming years? Uh, in the coming years, I, I'm. I, I think there's. Um, more of what you've been talking about i guess the that combining of not quite sure on the right term to put on it but the the disciplines the ways of thinking the the frameworks the 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 combination of those um having tools that make things a lot easier to do there's a lot of talk now about artificial intelligence coming into service management or any area of IT and, and the business and delivering those capabilities to customers as well. Mm. I'm not sure that you that it's necessarily always artificial intelligence um, that's actually being delivered. It's a programmed learning to deliver a response. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, AI is the term that we're putting on it. Um, and I think those sorts of things will help make a difference as well uh, from a, a, a um, capabilities that are starting to become available now from vendors of um, being able to analyze incoming um, requests for incidents or service requests into a service desk and, and learning from the historical data that you've got, um, putting it into a learning mode so it assesses all that information, then it starts looking at requests coming in and once you get to a point of achieving you can decide what level's appropriate, but maybe 90, 95% accuracy. So, okay, we're going to turn that on now, and that's going to be our first point of processing an inbound request. We don't need people to do that first bit um, and know that that allocation of work is going to be right. Um, being able to look at um, behavior from a technology or infrastructure point of view and say, well, we're seeing these things happen in systems. Historically, when those events start happening, we know this system's going to fall over. So let someone know that that's going to happen before we get to that point. So I think those sorts of things are something that's going to change. Um, and that's just within the, the realms of IT management, but business applications are, are developing that sort of technology and being able to deliver value in, for staff and to customers. Uh, you know, banks doing the, the AI interface on their website. Um, it's still relatively new developments in technology to achieve those things. Um, and they're learning more and more as they start doing it on what they can achieve. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, area. And there was a lot of talk about that at the conference this week. And mm. um, April Allen, who you know, um, was mm. saying that you know, she really believes that knowledge management not for the first time perhaps, but knowledge management is really going to come into its own now because of artificial intelligence and chatbots. Because yeah. unless you've got knowledge management sorted, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, you're not going to win. It's not going to be uh, achievable. So you've got to have that knowledge that's curated and it's accurate and all that yeah. stuff um, to support all this um, yeah, artificial intelligence and chatbots and stuff. So that's going to be an interesting development. And I think the message there really is, Automation's great. It's a bit like saying, you know, if your processes are crap, they're going to be processes, crap processes anywhere. Um, it's about getting you, um, your basics sorted because just automating a bad process is not going to help. It's just going to happen faster, probably. <laughs> and it's still not delivering the outcomes that the business wants. So we have to be careful that we've got the right foundations and then say, you know, okay, now sort of, automate optimize what you've got and then look at automation so yeah. um so before we just wrap up i'm going to ask you about what's this good guidance thing that we keep hearing about <laughs> yeah so good guidance um i guess the best way to describe it is um uh, a cooperative group um independent consultants who can offer a, a range of capability around, um, if you look at the, you know, the people process technology triangle, 
and being able to cover all aspects of that uh, from the technology and solutions, the, the change management, whether that be from a, a technology perspective or organizational transformational change, the, the knowledge management you were talking about with April, um, James in the, the group with the um, service management and operations management experience and guidance from that side and, and Rob bringing in more of the, the, the business side, I guess, with the lean management, the mm. productivity development and all the things that he specializes in. So as a group, we've got a, a huge um, set of capabilities to, to offer any organization working through uh, technology or business projects. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's great for me to be able to talk about having that range of skills to bring into a customer. Yeah, and that applies to us all. So if I'm out there doing organisational change and I know that there's a need for knowledge or there's a need for technology or, you know, looking at processes that are ineffective, then we've got, you know, a lean aspect and it's good to be able to pull on all those other skills and, and capabilities. Um, yeah. You know, whether that's, um, what's the word, you know, physically in an organisation or virtually, which is what April and James have been doing. You know, James is actually physically there and April's delivering... Um, her services in a virtual sense. So, um, yeah, it's a very powerful coalition. I'm very happy to be part of this. Um, so, Paul, it's been a great conversation. Where are you off to next in your motorhome? Uh, well, we're in Pukekohe right now. We're going to be here for a, a few days. And then next week, heading down to the um, Hongo Waitomo area. You. A couple of days down there and then back home up to the north for a week, I think. Got to try and schedule in some time when I'm not travelling as well. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I really thank you for your time, Paul. It's been a great conversation. Lots of insights for anyone who's going to watch this. Um, so happy travels and be safe. And thanks again. Thanks so much, Karen. Pleasure talking to you.